You can hang yourself now. Well, Watchmen Episode 6 finally revealed the backstory of Louis Gossett Jr.'s character, Will Reeves. And I gotta brag, we totally called this one. It reveals Will's real identity. I think that he is actually the 1930s and 40s hero, Hooded Justice. You were right. But we've got a lot more predictions and Easter eggs from this episode here on Screen Crush. The opening title transitions from Watchmen Yellow to Minutemen written in purple. Purple is often how Hooded Justice's costume was colored in the comics. The Minutemen are the Watchmen version of the Justice Society of America, except those were superheroes who fought Nazis, and these people are all kind of crazy and are in it for the publicity. They're named after the Minutemen militias from the Revolutionary War. And these were civilians who were ready to fight the British on a moment's notice, but weren't officially part of the government. This makes them a perfect analog for vigilantes. When the rule of law can't protect society, society has to protect the rule of law. The episode opens on a clip from from the American Hero Story TV show that we've seen glimpses of in past episodes. There's a clock in the title card, another of Watchmen's inclusion of a clock in as many shots as possible. Fictional HJ, I call him HJ sometimes, is in police custody, much like Angela. This isn't the first time the show has drawn a parallel to Angela and Hood of Justice. They also matched cuts in a previous episode. Who am I? When I was little, every time I looked in the mirror, I saw a stranger staring back at me. The cops tell him, It all started with you. Meaning he inspired the other masked heroes. And this is one of the many traits he shares with Superman, which now the show is just blatantly pointing out with flashbacks. He's sent from a dying place by his parents. He also moved to New York from the Midwest and changed his name from the superhero alliterative Will Williams to Will Reeves much like Kal-El became Clark Kent. Though he names himself after real-life Marshall Bass Reeves, this surname is also shared by two actors who played Superman, George Reeves and Christopher Reeves. Another small Easter egg from the PDpedia, it's revealed that Will's hero, real-life Marshall Bass Reeves, might have been an inspiration for the Lone Ranger, who's one of the first masked heroes that would later inspire Superman. Later in the episode, Will is in a phone booth and decides to go on a vigilante murder spree. Though he doesn't change into his uniform in the booth, this is similar to Clark Kent's traditional transformation into Superman. He finds his wife is a baby wrapped in the American flag. Now, when Superman was discovered by the Kents, his baby blanket eventually became his cape and a symbol of heroism. It's also invulnerable and can protect humans from harm. But in the case of this American flag, it's an ironic statement. The flag that is meant to protect freedom is often used to abuse people's civil rights. And June is a reporter just like Lois Lane. She writes for the New Amsterdam News, the oldest black newspaper in America. And just another couple Superman comparisons, then we'll move on. Kal-El never feels at home among humans, just like Will doesn't fit in with the all-white police force. The first appearance of Superman, Action Comics number one, actually appears in this episode. Now in that issue, he doesn't fight supervillains. He stops a man from abusing a woman and apprehends a corrupt senator. These are the actions of a vigilante handling real world problems that the law can't fix much like Hooded Justice. And there are several backup stories in Action Comics number one. One of them is about a rancher turned vigilante returning home to avenge his father's death, which is like Will returning to Tulsa to kill members of the clan. But my favorite Superman connection is that Action Comics number one inspired Will to become Hooded Justice, just like Superman was the superhero that inspired the creation of so many other comic book heroes. The episode's title, This Extraordinary Being, is how Hollis Mason described Hooded Justice in his autobiography. However, I think it could be quoting a passage from Victor Hugo's The Hunchback of Notre Dame. It describes Quasimodo ringing the largest bell in the cathedral by leaping on top of it and swinging. It almost looks as if he has become the bell itself. Then, Hugo writes, the presence of this extraordinary being caused, as it were, a breath of life to circulate throughout the entire cathedral. Quasimodo, like Will, has to remain hidden. But when they assume another identity, either the giant bell creature or hooded justice, they're able to make the world sit up and notice them. You were in the paper this morning calling you a hero. Anyways, back to American Hero Story. It's a parody of Ryan Murphy properties like American Horror Story and American Crime Story. In fact, the actor who plays Hooded Justice, Cheyenne Jackson, appeared in American Horror Story. Now the action in this scene is ridiculous and over the top. Say cheese. <laughs> In the PDpedia, the extra material on HBO's website, Dale Petey describes the filmmaking as toggling between frenetic cuts, widescreen framing, and zooming close-ups on blood gushes and ripped clothing. Now look, I could be wrong, but that sounds like an on-the-nose description of the action in Zack Snyder's Watchmen movie. <laughs> The cops also say that Hooded Justice's noose is used for sex stuff. Now it's interesting to me that when HJ's life is dramatized, they make his conflict with the police about sex instead of race. 
And this is partly because racial issues are uncomfortable, but sex scandals get ratings. And there's precedence for this in the comics and in superhero stories in general. Early Wonder Woman stories were filled with bondage and fetish imagery. In general, people in The Watchmen get turned on by dressing up in costumes and beating people up. Hollis Mason even writes that for some people, dressing up in costume did have its, quote, more libidinous elements. Also in the comics, Dan Dryberg can only get an erection after becoming a superhero again. Nelson and Will have sex with their masks on, just like P.D. and Laura did in episode three. And in the comic, H.J. does become sexually aroused when he beats up the comedian. Now the cops mentioned that the film is, he's got a safe behind the painting of the white horse in his boudoir. Now a pale horse can refer to the metal band who played a Madison Square Garden when the squid monster attacked, the fourth horseman of the apocalypse, or Adrian Veidt's horse. But there's another important white horse with hidden meaning behind it. In episode two, we see a painting of Judd's called Martial Feats of Comanche Horsemanship. According to the PDpedia, this was a gift from Joe Keene, which is the senator's father or grandfather, to Judd's grandfather. You can infer from the letter that it's a symbol of leadership of the Cyclops. And speaking of the Cyclops symbol, you can also see it in the 7th Cavalry headquarters in the last episode. Will graduates from the police academy in 1938, just like his fellow Minuteman, Hollis Mason, the original Night Owl. Mason's badge number in the comics is 142, but I didn't spot him in this episode. If you did, please let me know where in the comments. Now, I love the way this episode seamlessly moves us from memory to memory. There's no fades or jarring transitions. The effects are just done in camera. Even this one, where we see Angela's face and Will's reflection which actually calls back to this moment in episode two. And speaking of the visuals, the 1921 race massacre continuously appears in the background of Will's memories in color. This is to show that this trauma is always with him in the front of his mind. The way it's overlaid with the black and white memories mimics how the comic book overlaid dialogue into separate scenes. At the police graduation, Angela is the only person in color, which refers to both her skin color among the all white cadets and her slowly melting into Will's black and white memories. And the officer's speech, the uniform a man wears changes him, has a double meaning, referring to both the police uniform Will wears during the day and the hooded justice uniform that he takes off at night. The officer who pins him is the real life Lieutenant Sam Battle, the NYPD's first black police officer. Now, since Will grew up idolizing Bass Reeves, it's logical that he would look up to Sam Battle as well. At the newsstand where we see Action Comics number one, we also see the New York Gazette, the fictional newspaper from the comic book. The Klan secret society is called Cyclops, and when the Klan originally began, its chief officer was called the Grand Cyclops. And also, I didn't realize this until I researched it, that's the reason the Cyclops and her brother where art thou was a member of the clan. This poster of a hand holding a beer is a replication of several comic panels of hands touching beverages. In particular, book four of Watchmen, where Dr. Manhattan recalls his origin story, much like Will is telling his origin story here. Then his wife asks him the key question. Why'd you put it on? Now in the comics, the reader assumed that Hooded Justice's costume was a nod toward a hangman executing justice that was beyond the law, like we see the townspeople attempt in the movie that opens up the entire series. Since superheroes are a uniquely American invention, they're tied to our perception of Old West vigilante justice. But Will's costume is inspired by the dark side of the American story. And yes, law officers hanged outlaws in the Old West, but there's also a vile history of using lynching to murder innocents and suppress civil rights. And both mob justice and racial lynching were groups or individuals taking justice into their own hands, like superheroes. So keeping the hood and noose is an ironic statement about how he became a superhero and about the way Americans have viewed vigilante justice in the past. His first appearance, Stopping a Mugging, fits in line with how Hollis Mason described the events in his autobiography, Under the Hood. But the second encounter was very different from the version reported in the papers and that we see on American Heroes story. Rather than stopping a robbery, he was beating up a Klan member and jumped out of the window. Now, I assume the reason for this was that they had to hide the Klansmen and the secret operation taking place in the rear of the store. So the cover story is that he stopped a robbery and not a Klan meeting. But this is symbolic of how history alters or ignores racial violence much like the Tulsa race massacre. Will becomes hooded justice because as a black man on a racist police force, the only way he could find justice was to wear a disguise. The white makeup he wears parallels the black makeup that his granddaughter Angela wears in her alternate identity. The Klan's plot is to use movies to hypnotize black people into murdering each other. And there's a lot of symbolism to unpack here. One, how the earliest movies spread racist propaganda and cast black people as enemies. The best example of this is Birth of a Nation, which caused Klan membership to soar after its release. But apart from racial politics, there's a long history of hypnotism in pulp villains. This goes all the way back to Dracula, right up to modern day villains like the Purple Man and Jessica Jones. And subliminal messages in movies were a real thing. A market researcher named James Vicary inserted subliminal messages to eat popcorn and drink Coke into a film and then he reported a 57% increase in popcorn sales. We also find out that Will and Nelson are gay, as it was rumored. The song during the sex scene, The Ink Spots Whispering Grass, is about a secret love that's become known. 
like Will's homosexuality. And side note, according to the PDpedia, Nelson ended up leaving his entire estate to Will after he died. So Will's a millionaire and Nelson felt some sort of affection or at least guilt toward Will. When the Minutemen hold the press conference, the song is Me Three, My Echo, My Shadow, and Me, again by the Ink Spots. Will's shadow is Hooded Justice, this white lie persona that he has to hide behind. But the Echo also harkens back to the title, how Quasimodo could be heard but not seen. In the same way, Will's deeds get written up in newspapers, but nobody sees his actions for what they really are. The words he says at the meeting, I believe there is a vast and insidious conspiracy at play in the city are the same he uttered to Angela in episode two. There's a vast and insidious conspiracy at play here in Tulsa. Nelson mentions a new villain named Moloch with a super weapon. Moloch was an opponent of the Minutemen and later generations of heroes in the comics. His super weapon is the solar mirror that we see in American Hero Story. At the end of the press conference, they unveil their sponsor, First National Bank. This poster shows a hero of Dollar Bill apprehending a young black man. You may remember this poster from the pilot in the headquarters of the 7th Cavalry. Also, the bank that Laurie pretends to rob in episode three was First National Bank. So this whole press conference scene is reminiscent of Captain Metropolis trying to organize a second costume adventure a group, the Crime Busters, in the 1960s. That group broke up during its first meeting after the comedian told them that being a superhero ignores the real problem, nuclear war. In the same way, the Minutemen chase muggers but ignore the underlying problem of their era, racism. June is reading a Wizard of Oz book to her son. It's called Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz. In that book, Dorothy and the Wizard meet a race of people who eat magic fruit to turn invisible so they can avoid being eaten by bears. This is similar to Will, keeping his identity a secret to avoid being killed by the clan. The film playing in the theater is The Secret Life of Walter Mitty, the 1947 version. It's about an office worker who fantasizes about a more adventurous life. Now this, again, is similar to Will, who lives a fantasy life to escape the horror of his actual job. The clan's plot to subvert film show the medium has two sides. It can inspire violence and hatred, or, as we saw in the first episode, it can inspire law and order. Will obviously studied their projector technology and learned how to make subliminal messages of his own. The flicker even mimics the light of a film projector. So, over the years, he's still been fighting the clan, just with hypnotism, not his fists. I'm wondering if his hypnotism technology had something to do with Adrian Veidt selling his company to Lady True. His son wants to dress up in his dad's uniform, just like Will wore his dad's uniform in episode two, except he doesn't want his son to inherit his violent nature. This is unlike Judd, who defends keeping his grandfather's clan robe. I have a right to keep it, it's my legacy. Back in the present, Lady True is reading The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand, founder of the Ayn Rand School for Tots. Now, I haven't read the book, but Rand's work is known for its emphasis on objectivism. Basically, that means that an individual's responsibility is only to themselves and not to others. This should tell you a lot about Lady True's character. Now, if you know more about Ayn Rand and you have some insights into this, please let me know down in the comments. But frankly, South Park warned me off Ayn Rand years ago. I read every last word of this garbage, and because of this piece of sh I'm never reading again! Smoke and fire are the main visual themes of the episode. The titles transition with a puff of smoke. Will's anger is a metaphorical fire that was first ignited at the race massacre. Because you are an angry, angry man, William Reeves. His vision is filled with smoke while he's being lynched. When his first mission starts, the song playing is I Don't Want to Set the World on Fire by the Ink Spots. I don't want to set the world on fire. Because at this point, Will doesn't want to burn the whole world down. He's only after a small, specific group of bad people. There's also the idea of smoke and mirrors, like the clan deceiving people and infiltrating the police. Mirrors appear frequently throughout the episode, as Will has to face what he's becoming. And of course, all of these metaphors culminate in the climax of the episode, when Will sets fire to the clan's warehouse. The song playing is Smoke Gets In Your Eyes by The Platters. Now, my interpretation of that is that Will has lost sight of who he was, his vision is clouded with smoke. Now, my main criticism of this episode is that Will's wife leaves him. I thought it would help you get rid of this thing you have, but you didn't get rid of it and just fed. But we don't see him do anything that monstrous. Executing a warehouse of clan members who've been slaughtering black people with movie projectors isn't legal. You can kind of argue that it's justified. Now, maybe we should have seen him be angry or violent at home just some example of what June was talking about. I mentioned earlier that the real life Minutemen were formed because the law wasn't enough to protect them. And the same is true for Will Reeves. The police are controlled by white supremacists, so he has to step outside the law to bring justice. This goes against the Bass Reeves film that inspired him as a child, where the hero declared, No more justice today, trust in the law. After Will says, Stop in the name of the law! The racist replies, I thought they only said that in the pictures. Illustrating that Will's belief in the law is fantasy, something you can only find in old westerns. But the racist also says, So what is it? Huh? The name of the law. 
And this is the real question of the show. Who do we trust to police us? Who watches The Watchmen? Now here's my theory for the next few episodes. The Millennium Clock is actually a giant hypnotism machine that's gonna brainwash everyone in the United States or at least share memories of horrible racial trauma with the white population. So what do you think? What are your theories? Tell me down in the comments below along with your analysis of the show. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy. Thank you.